So my top five favorite watches are, firstly, the Jaeger Le Coultre uh, Reverso, naturally. I bought one just after completing my first Jurassic Park movie. A little prezi for moi. So my absolute fave has to be the Cartier Tank. Classic, you know? Classy, nothing is classy. Some say Patek, but I'm Hugo Mountbatten, darlings, not a football manager. My third watch. Lovely little thing from Adumar Piguet. Before they started making those absolutely ghastly offshores. Hello? It's a little gift from the Hello? Khan. Or oh, hang on a minute. Maybe it was oh. Prince Albert Monaco. A blast, I can't remember. Typical, typical. Hugo, what the hell are you doing? Turn this thing off. Oh, what o TGV? What does it look like I'm doing, darling? Zhuzhing up your channel a little bit. You can't talk about Rolex, Seiko, that ghastly Thomas Cruiser Casio. Oh, and let's not forget bloody Squale all the time. Listen, it's Cruz, Tom Cruise, okay? And besides, this is my channel. I get to talk about the things I love. That's why I started it. Otherwise, what's the point? Oh, at least more Cartier, darling. Okay? Fine, I'll think about it. Besides, I like Cartier, but none of that Richard Millet stuff, what you movie stars wear, okay? Oh, good God, no. Absolutely, awfully, terribly, frightfully, monstrously, terrifically, hideous, bad taste. I tell you what, I'll do you a deal. I promise to cover Cartier more if you stop calling me darling, okay? Oh, jolly good. Um, da, uh, da, uh, da, I mean, I mean um, old sport. How's that? Better? Having a favourite of something is difficult. If you asked me what my favourite film is, I would name about a hundred. Food, well, it's the same thing. It depends what you're in the mood for at that time. And for watches, it can be kind of the same thing. But there are five I always keep coming back to. So you guys asked, and here it is. And I'm gonna talk about my personal journey with five watches that I love the most and precisely why I adore them so much. This also coincides with celebrating five years of one of my favorites, The Explorer. Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. And I'll start off with the wristwatch check. And naturally, it is of course The Explorer on the SOE strap I designed for Risk Candy Watch Club. I know I've been wearing this combo a lot, but fairly new release, and I think it just works perfectly. In fact, to such an extent, I'm considering buying Nike Air Max 90s with blue colors just to match the strap. True story, true story. <laughs> so we'll see, we'll see how that goes. So let's get the most obvious watch out of the way because most likely you are sick of me talking about it. And that is of course the Flightmaster SNA411, AKA the Flighty. This is a watch I have an extremely long history with. It started several years before I even knew what YouTube was. I have been a Seiko fan as long as I can remember. I think it started sometime in my childhood. A decade ago, I knew hardly anything about watches, just the very basics. In fact, you could say the same thing now, as we are all in, or should be in, a state of perpetual learning. This is why I always call myself a watch enthusiast. I feel it would be arrogant or pretentious to call myself an aficionado or connoisseur. I wanted a tough watch that could do it all. Bear in mind, this was way before we became so dependent on our smartphones. The glorious age of flip phones and pages. As online retail was in its infancy, I actually bought my first flighty at Macy's on 34th Street. 
And if you've ever been to New York, yes, I'm talking about that one. So can you believe it? I paid retail, absolutely ghastly, as uh, old Hugo would say. Uh, this was, well, it proves I didn't really know that much. And also this was way before I met Mark and became a customer of Long Island Watch. Its specifications won me over. Shortly after the purchase, I was due to fly to Miami to see family who were visiting from the old country. The high 200 meters water resistance was perfect for the pool, even if the alarm was disappointingly weak and would not be loud enough to wake me from mojito-induced hangovers. However, being able to set the two-handed subdial at the six o'clock to a second time zone was fantastically useful in coordinating with my relatives flying across the pond. Fast forward to over a decade later, and here we are. It's the watch I have consistently owned for the longest period of time, not including family heirlooms, of course, and since then my appreciation has only increased. My videos on Seiko's illustrious past in making chronographs for the RAF and exploring their innovative history of making the world's first quartz chronograph only have deepened my love for this amazing watch. The super accurate 7T62 movement inside this relatively modest watch connects the wearer to this amazing long legacy of of innovation. It elevates my enjoyment as I wear it. It's by no means perfect. It's got its little quirks, but somehow it makes it um, a little bit more unique. That segues nicely into my next favorite as it shares the same busy look and intended purpose. That's right, we're talking about the Breitling Navitimer. I distinctly remember seeing one of these for the first time, sitting in a jeweler's in Barcelona while I was living there for a year. I didn't know much about it, and to be completely honest, I just really liked the look of it. It was quite simple. A few years passed, the flighty was serving me faithfully in the meantime, but it wasn't until around 2015 I saved up enough and decided to pull the trigger. And by 2021, I have owned several versions. The quintessential automatic from the mid 2000s in that striking blue, then the classic vintage 806, before the busiest of them all, the Le Mania based manual wind Cosmonaut. And it's a rabbit hole so deep, there is a ton of fascinating history. A space going legend that predated the Speedmaster Moonwatch with a totally unique way of showing time in a 24 hour manner that was unlike anything I had experienced before. It also happened to be the first purpose built true chronograph wristwatch for space exploration. It killed off my love for the Speedy. I mean, that's just how profound uh, my admiration for it is. And I, I think to quote Quentin Tarantino, he famously said, uh, there are two types of people in this world. There are Elvis people and there are Beatles people, right? And I think the same could be said about um, watch enthusiasts. There are Navitimer people and there are Speedmaster people. Can they coexist? Is it just me or, I don't know, what do you guys think? Speaking of divisiveness, this next one is pure Marmite and the most recent addition in my top five. We are of course talking about the Casio DW290, AKA the Mission Impossible watch. A watch I put off reviewing for donkey's year simply because it was so damned funny looking with that brutalist 80s style that should belong in a Paul Verhoeven movie. And no, I'm not talking about that one. I'm actually talking about the more sci-fi retro ones. <laughs> you think this is the real Quaid? It is. But as I get older, the nostalgia and charm of the older James Bond movies increases. So much so, I actually prefer the Mission Impossible franchise over Daniel Craig era of Bond movies. I know, sacrilegious, but Hear me out. Being a fan of Brian De Palma and Tom Cruise, ignoring the cringeworthy sequel by the legendary John Woo, they have got increasingly better as the franchise went along. So that all motivated me to purchase one and how wrong I was. The design is actually very clever and very deliberate, super comfortable, uber functional, and unlike my G-Shock, works with just about any strap with no need for adapters. And like all the watches talked about so far, it is another rabbit warren of history to delve into. Now, best of all, the price of admission with this watch is 35 bucks, 
well that's how much it cost me at the time and you know the, the ratio of fun to dollar value is just crazy especially when you start discovering all the hidden depths uh, behind the story and history of this watch and guys if you missed it check out this video because I go into it in a little bit more detail uh, so much so it's become my favorite Casio so this next one was for many years my favorite watch of all time but alas has been dethroned by a new king of my watch collection more on that later the Rolex Explorer is a watch that for decades I dismissed as well a tad boring so why would I buy one in 2016? At the time, I was very content with my Submariner. I'd actually look at the Explorer and think, this thing has no bezel, I can't time my cardio, no date, no presence like my Subby. Why would anyone ever buy that? Then a friend lent me one for a week to take for a spin. Simultaneously, I discovered it was in fact most likely the actual true Bond watch as Ian Fleming wore the vintage 1016 and name dropped an Oyster Perpetual in the novels. Never the sub like in the movies. This intrigued me to start digging. It turns out there was a lot more far beyond its Mount Everest conquering genesis with Tenzig Norgay and Sir Edmund Hillary before Explorer appeared on the dial. Its slow release charm and discreet Bondian vibes made me feel and still does actually, um, much more kind of like the super spy <laughs> than the sub ever did. It's perfect dressy 11.1 millimeters thick proportions, yet capable sporty robustness combined with the simplicity of the balanced and iconic numeral layout just won me over. This epitomizes and proves that you really need to experience something before passing judgment something unfortunately not learned in the watch world just read the comments to any video but beyond all that there is something inherently british about its understated nature the ultimate encapsulation of less is more in a world filled with tacky blinged out bust down watches crass oversized over engineered vulgarity usually worn by those with more money and taste then there's the 36 millimeter explorer quietly unassumingly on the wrist, gaining value and doing what all watches are supposed to do and that is fundamentally to tell the time. If this watch was a person it would look like Sean Connery driving an Aston Martin in a tweed jacket, smelling of Floris 69, a Fortnum and Mason hamper in the back with your woman in the seat next to him opening some champagne. It has that whiff of old money, it does not need to prove itself being overtly flash Kind of like a more masculine Bertie Wooster that is not so sheltered from the world and ready to summit a mountain. Most interestingly, the effect of the Explorer dial layout then permeated into my admiration for other watches. It inspired my last Seamaster, which, had this been a top 10, probably might even take the number 6 position. It features a similar time-only, non-complicated numeral layout. It's from the late 1950s, and while it is solid gold, there are similarities aside from the clean look. Its toughness was the stuff of legends, and was even strapped to the outside of a plane and flown to prove it. It has an extremely well-respected automatic movement, the famous proprietary made Caliber 500, famed for reliability and accuracy. I mean, just look at that thing. The swan neck regulator, for example, is the kind of thing you see in high-end dress watches. My love for the Explorer is also a part of the reason of its undoing in it being um, usurped <laughs> or succeeded uh, in its reign as my uh, favorite watch. Buy a watch from, and you guys know it, I, I adore this brand, Squale, a, a Swiss uh, independent, historically important heritage brand. The iconic 50 Atmos, or 1521, I purchased during the early days on the YouTube got me hooked. A watch I will be rebuying for what seems to be the millionth time at Christmas. During a visit to their HQ in Switzerland in 2017, I met Andrea Maggi, the owner of the brand, and he pulled out from the archives one of the first watch cases they ever made, not only for themselves, but like the 50 Atmos, also for Blanc Bain. 
This gentleman's diver was a little small, but typical of the time at 34 millimeters in diameter, but it had a truly beautiful case. Its lines, Cadillac curves, and being from the birth of the modern dive watch as we know it, and obviously that connection to black bone. I jokingly said, if you bring it back to a modern 39 millimeters, you will have a hit. Sure enough, and unexpectedly, they did just that two years later with the newly redesigned and modernized Sub 3930 Atmos, but this time with an automatic ETA. So as a thank you, they honored me with my own limited edition and they asked me, well, what changes would you like? And I wanted to differentiate it from the blue of the date version. Uh, so I went for an Air Force kind of gray blue. And naturally, as I was still in the midst of my long honeymoon with the Explorer, I wanted an Explorer style dial, something similar to the Rolex and it being no date, obviously. They granted my wish and hence a new favorite was born. Now I realize, and I've said this before, there is no such thing as a perfect watch. In fact, sometimes it's the imperfections that give it a little bit of magic. But this Meraviglia would become my new favorite. Now divers are the most popular style of watch for men for many reasons, not just because of that James Bond sense of adventure, but mainly what they were originally intended for, as tough, legible tools for diving. This has translated into something great for every day. Brands like Rolex, Blancpain, Squire, Omega, etc. all knew this. Eventually dive watches either diversified into luxury items with a more dressy look, or new lines were created entirely devoted to strictly deep diving. The Rolex Submariner and Sea Dweller dichotomy is perhaps the best example of this. There's something inherently appealing about knowing it. it is capable of going to such depths. Even though, uh, for me, my diving days are long gone with these dicky lungs. It has just the right mixture of elegant sartorial versatility in aesthetic, but actually being 300 meter capable. From a heritage brand going back to the dawn of dive watches, and now combined with a favorite harmonious dial layout of perfect unbroken symmetry. Is it any wonder it's now my favorite watch of all time? And as I record this, I remember my friend Mark saying that one of the things that attracts him to certain watches he collects is the idea of owning pieces that not necessarily everyone has. And he's right. The TGV Sub 39 is a watch that doesn't get any more rare or deeper in meaning. That's a watch I will go to my grave smiling about. A common thing people say is that everyone has a Submariner. Well, it seems today the same could be said about the Explorer. I mean, even the haters of Rolex like it. It seems the once largely neglected Explorer has now become a new favorite among the trendy. So do I love my Explorer any less because of this? I don't think so. I mean, look, it's just that something has come along that you love even more. Will this top five change a year from now? I think quite possibly. Firstly, it's perfectly natural to fall in and out of love with watches. It's a common occurrence and a part of collecting. And secondly, I have been designing several new watches coming out later this year. One in particular project has taken three years to develop that will most likely once again change my perceptions. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Okay guys, so I'm gonna leave it there. Please do add in the comments below your five favorite watches and why you love them. I think that's um, crucially important and interesting. I love hearing back from you guys. So that's about it. Thank you so much for watching. Please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it and found it useful, very important indeed. And as always, I will catch you in the next one. Thank you for watching. Ciao.